our story today begins, begins with Prince Henry the Navigator. Uh, Prince Henry was the youngest son of King John I of Portugal, uh, born in 1394, uh, lived till I think about 1460. And Prince Henry had a vision. Portugal at the time was a very poor nation, small nation, poor nation. Prince Henry's vision was that somehow or some way, there had to be a sea route that would take you to India and parts of Asia beyond. And that if you could find that sea route, you could control world trade, as the Europeans and others knew it at the time. If you think about the Italian Renaissance, right? Think about the magnificence of the cities, the structures, the art. Think about the wealthy families like the, uh, the Medici's and others. Where did the wealth come from? The wealth came from the fact that these Italian city-states would take their ships and would go to the eastern end of the Mediterranean. There they would carry European goods. They would exchange with Arabs who had controlled Number one, either the overland routes coming in from Asia or the sea routes coming from, from India up through the Red Sea. And the great middlemen of world trade at the time were the Italians and the Arabs. Prince Henry had this vision. What if? What if we could find a direct sea route to India? We could cut out the Italians and the Arabs. We could control this wealth. constantly would pester his father about this. And in 1415, you'll see this map of the Age of Exploration here. And you can see where Portugal is up there on the Iberian Peninsula. And Henry's vision was somehow or some way, there had to be a way through or around Africa that would take you directly to India. And they began to experiment with shipbuilding. They began to experiment uh, with learning navigation, et cetera. And in 1415, they took a huge step. They conquered the Arabic city of Ceuta. Ceuta, at the time, was a very prosperous, wealthy city that existed off the trade coming overland and through the Mediterranean. And the Portuguese launched an invasion of Ceuta and took it in 1415. And this was a very energetic springboard, if you will, to keep pushing further. And what was going on for the remainder of Henry's life was that they were sending voyages out and they were going down and mapping the coast of Africa. So they would go down they would get back from one of these voyages. They would add to their cartographic knowledge of the coast of Africa. They would explore water inlets, hoping that maybe one of them was going to be a river or a, or a, sea, a sea route to go through Africa. And they kept working their way down. And every time one of these voyages would get back, it was like a constant um, uh, think tank of technology. They would come back. They would add to their cartographic knowledge. They would ask the questions, how can we build the ships better? How can we navigate better? How can we do this better? And so they're constantly creating new information, new technology through instruments and so forth. And it's in this process that they developed, and Prince Henry really was the visionary for this as well, they developed a type of ship known as the caravel. These caravels, once developed, would be very agile. They'd be easy to navigate. They averaged around 50 to 60 tons, uh, averaged about 39 to 50 feet in length. They had a couple of innovations to them. One innovation was they employed not only the square sail, but the lateen sail. And the lateen sail, as you can see, are these triangular type sails. So, by using square cells and latine cells, what that did for the ship was when they're, when they're cruising the coast and they're in shallower waters and they need to have that ship be very agile and maneuverable, 
They wouldn't use their square cells so they didn't get blown onto reefs or anything. They would use that latine, the latine cells, which gave them that incredible agility. And then when you're in the open seas, away from the coast, you use your big square cells and you capture the wind. So not only did they develop the caravel, and really Prince Henry is probably the mastermind behind it. One other innovation they put on the caravel was the bottoms were rounded and smooth, which increased their efficiency and made them faster, faster than any other vessels of the time. You know, I, I don't know about you all, but, but think, about, think about how connected we are through world trade. I think we just take it for granted until something happens, right? Think about COVID, when the economies of the world were shutting down and our supply chains, which move primarily by sea, all got disrupted. COVID ended, demand went back up, right? But it took the supply chains a while to really get back up to speed. And so you had a lot of demand uh, chasing um, not as much supply. We all saw what happened with that. <clears throat> Scarcity, prices go up. You know, it's, 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 it's Adam Newton 101, right? Not Adam, Adam Smith 101, uh, supply and demand. When demand is high and supply is low, guess what? Your wallet takes a big hit. This system of global trade that we all depend on every day, this system began with the Portuguese. This is when the global trading system begins. Right here. Think about these caravels. You know, I, I know when we talk about these ships, we have in our minds our big naval ships. We have in our minds uh, the big, huge cruise ships, right? We forget how small these ships were. I mean, at its, at its largest, a caravel might have been 50 feet long. Think about that one. Have you ever gone and looked at one of these older ships that's been restored? I know, the, I know every time I do, and it, and it never fails, I just think to myself, God, these things were small. And these people are going out in open ocean not knowing, you know, they're unchartered waters. There's no GPS, there's no, there's no calling for the Coast Guard to come help you. Not happening. It really, it really just boggles the imagination of how intrepid and how brave these people were to, to do this. Well, by the time that Prince Henry died in 1460, they had worked their way down pretty far along the coast of Africa, making contact along the way, setting up trading posts, uh, building on their, their cartographic knowledge. And the table was set for the ultimate voyage here, at least so far. And that is the voyage of Bartolomeu Dias. And one thing I want to mention before we get too far into Dias and and some of the folks who came after him, like da Gama and Cabral and, and others, is that the Portuguese not only were setting out to try to control trade routes, but there were other parts of that mission as well. Part of it was to spread Christianity. Part of it was to find the elusive and mythical Prester John. I don't know if you've ever heard of Prester John or not. Um, Prester John, this, this myth, if you will, had been around since the Middle Ages, that somewhere in Africa or in the Far East, there was this very prosperous, wealthy, powerful Christian kingdom that is isolated from the rest of Christianity, and it's led by a man named Prester John, which I always thought was interesting because generation after generation of people in this period all talked about Prester John. My God, how old must he have been, right? Uh, but find Prester John, spread Christianity, control the trade routes. Uh, these were all things that, that factored in. And one of the things they did, and it kind of represents this whole thing in microcosm, if you will, is they always took with them somewhere, anywhere between five to 10, what they called padrus. That is, a, is an example of a padru. So every one of these explorers used their own discretion. They would oftentimes 
plant one of these padrus at a river, mouth of a river, a promontory, at the top of a hill, and it symbolized a number of things. First of all, planting of Christianity, claims by Portugal, we are laying claim to this area. It symbolized all of these things, the primacy of Portugal. And you can still find these pedraus um, in Africa and elsewhere today. They started out uh, building them with wood. And what they found was in some of these tropical areas, they'd go back after a while and the pedrao was just you know, deteriorating. So very quickly, they're all made of, of stone. So when you see a pedrao uh, today, uh, odds are they're, they're going to all be stone ones because the, the wood just didn't work out for them. Well, having said all of this, the voyage that is the breakthrough was a voyage undertaken by the Portuguese commander Bartolomeu Dias. Dias had been charged by King John II of finding the way around Africa, finding the way into the Indian Ocean. There was a couple of, of beliefs about the Indian Ocean at the time. Uh, some of these folks uh, believed the idea that the Indian Ocean was landlocked, it was a lake. Dios was going to prove that to be a fallacy. He followed the voyage of Diego Cal, who, who had undertaken two previous voyages to try to find the way around Africa and had failed both times. King John II was determined that the effort was going to continue and that it was going to meet with success. He commissioned Dios to lead an expedition to find the trade route around Africa. And also, if, while you're at it, find Prester John. He was provided with two caravels, about 50 tons each. He recruited some of the leading sailors and navigators and pilots of his day. Unfortunately, there are no contemporary documents we can look at from this voyage. Because in 1755, Lisbon suffered a horrible earthquake that even triggered tsunamis. And the archives building, where all of the letters all of the archival information from the time of Dias's voyage was destroyed. So historians have been able to piece it together through other letters, uh, piece it together uh, through uh, memoirs and things that people wrote and commented on afterwards to, uh, to kind of piece the voyage together. And there's still a couple of questions that you know, I, I think are still a bit unsettled about the Dias voyage. Uh, they left Lisbon in 1487, and as they were coming down the coast, as they're coming down, somewhere around current day, maybe off the, uh, off the Horn of Africa, the voyage went out to sea. You can see the deviation here if you follow this blue line, how they come way out. And it was the first Portuguese voyage that had gone into open water where they couldn't see land. All the previous voyages, they hugged the African coast. Now, there are two theories as to why Dios ventured so further out and away from the coast. Uh, one is, is that he got caught in a storm and that they got blown out into the open sea and that Dios basically then said, OK, you know, we, we don't need to panic here. All we need to do is set a course north by northeast. Because if we go north by northeast, one of two things will happen. We either run back into Africa or we found our way around it. Now, the other, the other theory about this is, is that they didn't accidentally get blown out to course and off course, and they didn't venture out. Uh, because of weather conditions is that Dios did it on purpose because he had gotten to a point where he wasn't getting any real winds. And so he figured if he went out, he might be able to tap into some different winds. And sure enough, this became standard for a lot of the Portuguese voyages after this is that when they would get down, they would go out and tap into these westerly winds. But nevertheless, uh, one, of two, one of two things, either the storm or he did it on purpose. 
Uh, I guess if you're Dioshi, you come back and say, I did it on purpose, you know. Uh, yeah, I knew it all along. Sure. Well, sure enough, they tack in north by northeast and at some point realize they have found their way around what now is the Cape of Good Hope. He's the first European voyager to enter the Indian Ocean. And of course, at this point, his crew's getting restless, they're running low on supplies, they turn around and head home with the news. And of course, the news is met with great excitement. But in the meantime, as Portugal now prepares to really send a voyage out to further take advantage of this knowledge, at this point, King John II is approached by an Italian navigator by the name of Christopher Columbus. Columbus was pretty much all self-taught in terms of his knowledge of seafaring and navigation. Uh, he had spent a lot of time in Portugal because this is where everything was going on and he learned quite a bit in Portugal. And so he went to King John, he said, listen, now Columbus didn't know. When he goes to King John II, he didn't know that the breakthrough had occurred. He didn't know that Dios had found his way around. These, these charts, the navigational information, these were about as closely guarded state secrets as you could have. Well, imagine that. The Portuguese spent all these decades, right? All these voyages, and if they're just gonna give that information out, then anybody can have it. Closely guarded. So Columbus goes to King John II says, listen, I, I understand you're trying to find a way. You're going down Africa. You're trying to find a way around or through. OK, but you're doing it all wrong. All you got to do is sail directly west, and you'll hit the Indies. You'll hit India in about 3,000 miles. King John II heard him out. And, God, can it be? After all of this, there's a shorter, easier way, and we've done all this for nothing. King John II calls in his navigational minds. Can this guy be right? No, he's not right. We are not disputing the fact, they told him, that you can get to India by sailing west, but it's not 3,000 miles. They didn't know how far it was, but there's no way it's 3,000 miles, they said, based on what they already knew. Now, Columbus made two basic errors. He underestimated the circumference of the globe. And based on the writings of Marco Polo, he thought that the Asian mainland extended about 2,000 more miles further east than what it did. So you take his navigational error on circumference, you take his, his error on the eastern you know, scope of the Asian mainland, and he's roughly got about a six to 8,000 mile error, and you add his original three, and yeah, sure, you leave Portugal, you sail west, as long as there's nothing in your way, right? Like two continents. Um, <laughs> you theoretically could get to India, eight, nine, 10,000 miles, sure. Well, King John II sends Columbus packing. Columbus then took his ideas to Spain. And the timing was great on this because Spain in 1492, Spain had just unified the crowns of Aragon and Castile. They had fought the Battle of Grenada. They had, after a seven year struggle to expel the Moors in the Reconquista, they had done it. Big, pa proud, powerful nation. Little Portugal's out doing all this other stuff. Here's a chance to eclipse the Portuguese. Everything the Portuguese have done for the last 80 years to eclipse them in one move. Who wouldn't roll the dice on it? So you know the story. They outfit Columbus with his three ships, three caravels. Off they go. Columbus comes back all smug. I was right. And you know, I, I was in India. And yeah, of course, poor Native Americans have been stuck with the name ever since. You know? <laughs> Indians. They're not Indians. Yeah. But that's another story for another time, I suppose. Um, so. As you know, Columbus ends up doing three more voyages, uh, never goes, goes to his grave, never, 
never really admitting it wasn't India. Um, it was Amerigo Vespucci who eventually proved it, ended the debate that was going on in Europe over whether this was India or whether this was a <clears throat> new world. But one of the results of Columbus's voyage and what the Portuguese were doing was is that now there was this chance that these two great Catholic powers could be warring over this stuff. Church didn't want that. The Pope at the time, Alexander VI, offered to mediate on claims and future claims between Spain and Portugal. What resulted from that is a really remarkable treaty. I mean, every time you think about this treaty and, and so forth, you just gotta, it's like, wow, the times were so different. The Treaty of Tordesillas, 1494, in which the Pope mediated it, they drew a line through what they thought was the earth. The line ran from north to south about 370 leagues to the west of the Cape Verde Islands. And basically said everything to the west of this line, known and unknown, is reserved for Spain. Everything east of this line, known and unknown, is reserved for Portugal. No need for anybody else, England, France, the Dutch, no, no need. It's all taken. And of course, what the church made them pledge, in addition to giving God's blessing for this division of the world, uh, was that they would spread Christianity wherever they went. And they, they both took that very seriously. Um, you know, Spain, which, you know, when you look at their empire, is going to be dramatically different in nature to the Portuguese because they had more people, more resources. Uh, the, the Spanish really took that seriously. Wherever they went, they would build fortresses and missions. They called it the Presidio and Mission. You can, you can see those today, can't you? Especially if you drive out to the southwest and, and so forth. So they both took it seriously. Spain probably was in a position to really implement it to a greater degree than Portugal was. And so it's against this background that the Portuguese outfitted the next voyage that was going to take them to India. Because they hadn't actually reached India yet. They, they knew how to do it at this point. They hadn't reached it yet. This was the voyage of Vasco da Gama. 1497, 1499. This was the voyage that was going to link Europe and Asia by sea. Da Gama makes it to India. Begins trying to set up some trade agreements and so forth. But this is really the beginning of the sea-based global trade system when he reaches India. The Portuguese now were working on trying to establish permanent positions and set up this whole trade. Cut out the Italians and Arabs. And of course, if you look at the Gama's voyage here, you'll see that he, he learned from the Dios voyage. And he didn't get blown off course by a storm. He actually deviated out. This became standard practice for the Portuguese to deviate out into open ocean, pick up those western winds, and let them carry you around the coast of Africa. You can see on the, the map here, and you can see he comes around, he begins to set up contact and some trade settlements along the uh, eastern coast of Africa and then over to India. So they're getting a tenuous start. And then they follow up on that with the voyage of Pedro Cabral. Cabral led the first expedition to what would become Brazil. When Cabral goes way out to catch the western winds, he touches the coast of Brazil. And this would lead to Portuguese claims to Brazil, which the Portuguese argued fell within, because Brazil jutted out so far, that this fell within their segment of Tordesillas. Cabral will become the first person that we know of in history to have set foot on four continents. Left Europe, right? It's one continent. South America, Africa, Asia. First human we know of 
set foot on four continents. And of course, he followed up, continued to try to, to work on the trading posts and so forth in India. You can see his voyage here. You can see how he deviates way out and how he touches the coast of Brazil and then comes around, boom, 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 and then, and then to the, uh, the Indian coast. But it was up to a man by the name of Alphonse Diabakirk. This man, he wasn't an explorer like Dias and da Gama and all that. This man was, was many things. He was a statesman. He was an admiral. He was a first-rate military mind. He could turn diplomat when the occasion called for it. He had all of the skills that the Portuguese needed to really get the roots set for the empire they hoped to build. He was a true visionary. He was the architect of the Portuguese system of trade and empire. He solidified Portugal's hold on the city of Goa. And one of the things the Portuguese benefited from with their attempts to get some trading posts set up in India was that at the time, India was not a unified country. There were all kinds of factions and rivalries and different warlords and so forth. And then you had constant struggle between Muslims and Hindus in India. And so Albuquerque was a master of playing on all that, of building alliances, et cetera. And he got permission and at times used force, sided with some of the Hindu princes in the area, and the Portuguese got control of an enclave in the city of Goa. And this becomes really the kind of the model for the Portuguese system. Think about Portugal. They're not a huge country like Spain. They don't have a huge population. And so their empire, unlike the Spanish empire, right, where, I mean, they, can't, they settled inland, they sent settlers over, they, you know, huge footprints. Uh -uh. Portugal didn't have those kind of resources. They didn't have the people to do that. So what they did was, and Goa was the model for this, is they would set up a fortress, and it was a fortress trading system. They controlled the port, they used their naval power when they needed to, they set up a fort, and then they traded in the area, built alliances, extracted what they needed out of India in terms of the spices and the goods to go back to Europe. In the meantime, though, he had to deal with the Arabs. Because a lot of the Arab traders had alliances, had set up systems in India so that they could then you know, trade in India, take the spices, take the goods, and then move them by ship up through the Red Sea. Albuquerque worked on eradicating Arab businessmen from uh, places like Goa. He also was the first first commander, the first European who put boats, sent ships, warships into the Red Sea. And he got control of the Red Sea, defeated the Arabs on water. He also took control of Hormuz. He solidified some more places in Africa. And he set what would become the linchpin and the model for the construction of the Portuguese Empire. He helped set the table. Think about, um, think about, if you will, that Spain at the time is not only really putting her, her roots down in parts of Central America, North America, but that Spain, especially after the voyage of Magellan, that Spain is pushing into the Pacific. And so at some point, under Albuquerque's system, you've got Spain laying claims to places where Portugal was already trying to get inroads in and vice versa. And so there had to be, there was a rectification of Tordesillas. And basically, it involved Spain's claims to a series of islands that we today call the Philippines. 
And Spain had not recognized Portugal's position in Brazil. And so one of the rectifications of Tordesillas was, OK, Spain says, we will recognize your position in Brazil, but we get these islands here. And they named the islands after the Spanish king at the time, King Philip, hence the Philippines, where it gets its name. Well, they continued to push, not only setting up Cochin, Goa, uh, Colombo on, on uh, the island of Sri Lanka, and then Albuquerque pushed on. He set up a Portuguese fortress trading post in Malacca, then on pushed further into the South Pacific. And as you can see, a brief trading post in Nagasaki in Japan. And of course, the one that lasts the longest, Macau in China. The Portuguese were in Macau from 1557 until 1999 from 1557 until 1999. The Chinese saw benefit in having the Portuguese there as a way of getting currency and so Because if you remember, after the Chinese Revolution, right, Communist Revolution, they were cut off from the world. And so they kind of turned a blind eye to the British in Hong Kong and to Macau because China was benefiting from it. Well. Of course, by the late 80s, this became intolerable for China. And they began to negotiate with Britain and Portugal. And you may recall that the British turned over Hong Kong to the Chinese in 1995. And of course, Macau doesn't get handed back over until 1997. I mean, you think about that one, right? And the long lasting uh, nature of, of the Portuguese empire in that regard. Well, of course, others were getting involved. The English were starting to, uh, to send out ships, the Dutch, the French. And ultimately, the Portuguese will get eclipsed uh, from, from some of their positions. And will get eclipsed uh, by the British and to a degree the Dutch. But it doesn't mean they lose their possessions because they, they kept a lot of them for centuries more. And the thing about about the Portuguese system was that the British benefited to a degree because you know, they, they modeled a lot of the way they built their, their empire on what the Portuguese had done. And you know, we always say about the British Empire, used to, the, the phrase used to be what? The sun never set on the British Empire. Well, come on, the first empire where the sun never set, right, was the Portuguese Empire. It becomes the model for what the British would do. So think about the legacy of the Portuguese Empire. They ushered in the modern global trading system. They provided a framework for the rise of other European empires, specifically the British. They led to the founding of the largest nation in South America, which today, of course, speaks Portuguese, Brazil. Today, Portugal is the sixth largest language in the world. The sixth largest language in the world in terms of speakers. Not bad for a relatively small nation with a current population of just over 10 million people. Think about that. And for those of you who are be going, will be going on the trip, there is in Lisbon a huge monument to Albuquerque. So try to go find that. Um, there's also a, a huge uh, padru that uh, is in Lisbon as well. So you may, you may want to look at that. Uh, another place, too, if, if you get there, and I'm not sure what the full itinerary of the trip is, but it could be if you have a free day or something, you might want to go down to Sagres, uh, S-A-G-R-E-S. Sagres is the place where Prince Henry set up shop, right on the tip of Portugal. Uh, and it's at Sagres that 
all of these minds got together. You know, and it was just this, this hot kind of fermentation of technology, of knowledge, of cartography, of shipbuilding. And uh, for the longest time, uh, they believed that there was actually a building and a school at Sawgrace that they did all this in. That's since pretty much been debunked. It was more of a loose knit kind of operation at Sawgrace. There wasn't a formal school for it, but the achievements were, but they speak for themselves, don't they? Yeah. So Portugal, the little nation that could. <laughs>